Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Funding for Shalom TV has been provided by the following and by viewers like you. In an effort to make progress towards peace in the Middle East and to implement the Bush administration's roadmap agreed to by both Israel and the Palestinians for a two-state solution. The Obama administration has recently made strong statements regarding Israeli settlements on the West Bank. Obama's Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, for example, has been adamant about America's insistence that Israel refrain from any settlement construction, including construction on the sites of existing settlements to accommodate normal natural growth, such as adding a room to an existing home for a newborn child or a newly married couple or to make a place for a parent or grandparent who needs family care. In his recent speech to the Muslim world in Cairo, the president stated that the United States does not accept the legitimacy of continued Israeli settlements. This construction violates previous agreements and undermines efforts to achieve peace. It's time for these settlements to stop. And in general, one often hears reference to the illegality of Israeli settlements. Are Israel's West Bank settlements illegal? Have Israeli settlements been a substantive obstacle to peace? How should Americans, and especially American Jews, view Israeli settlements? Well, the truth is, there's so much confusion and misinformation about Israeli settlements, we'd like to give you some factual information about Israeli settlements and give you a sense of the history of the way in which the United States has viewed the legitimacy or illegitimacy of Israeli settlements. And we're drawing upon the expertise of Dory Gold, an American born in Hartford, Connecticut, a graduate of Columbia University, where he also earned his Ph.D. in Middle East Studies. And Dory Gold made Aliyah in 1980 and went on to become Israel's ambassador to the United Nations from 1997 to 1999. Currently, Dory Gold is the president of the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, an independent think tank that focuses on Israel's rights under international law. And in the midst of Obama's strong statements about Israeli settlements, two questions need to be answered. One, is the Obama administration breaking from the policies of past American administrations? And two, when the president asserts that Israeli settlement construction violates past agreements, which agreements is the president referring to? Israeli settlements on the West Bank were first created more than 40 years ago in the aftermath of the Six-Day War of 1967 when they were used as military and agricultural outposts that were located for the most part in strategically significant areas which Israel planned to eventually claim. These settlements were also created in areas of the West Bank from which Jews had been evicted during the 1948 war. From the start of Israel's settlement activity, while the United States did not support Israel's policies, successive American administrations have had a very different attitude one from another and different policies. For example, after the Six-Day War of 1967, the Johnson administration was critical of Israeli settlement activity, but never characterized the settlements as illegal. In 1979, when the issue of Israeli settlements was brought to a vote in the United Nations, the Carter administration refused to vote in favor of condemning Israeli settlements. A year later, however, in 1980, 
Jimmy Carter decided to support a UN resolution calling for the dismantling of all Israeli settlements, and then later reversed his position again. In fact, the United States has never had a consistent policy on such questions as, are Israeli settlements a violation of international law? Are Israeli settlements a violation of agreements between Israel and its Arab neighbors? and an obstacle to further progress in any future peace talks. And to what extent does America envision Israel withdrawing completely to the 1967 Green Line border? Or does the U.S. accept the idea that Israel will retain parts of the West Bank as defensible borders and for its security needs? For many years, Washington opposed the settlements because it was felt that they were unilateral actions that prejudged the outcome of future negotiations. But American administrations have also felt the issue of settlements should be resolved in negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians themselves. It's very important to remember that Israel entered the West Bank in 1967 in a war of self-defense, so that UN Resolution 242, adopted in November of 1967 and which continues to be the authoritative international document regarding the West Bank, did not call upon Israel to withdraw from all of the West Bank territory that it captured during the Six-Day War. One of the most misunderstood facts regarding the West Bank concerns who has sovereignty over West Bank territories and whether any nation is in violation of another country's sovereign rights in the West Bank. For the truth is, from the end of World War I to this day, no nation has been recognized by the international community as having sovereign rights on the West Bank no nation. Before the partition of Palestine and the creation of the State of Israel in 1948, the West Bank was part of the British Mandate, which was simply administering all of Palestine at the direction of the League of Nations, which you may know had given international recognition to Jewish legal rights in Palestine. Great Britain's mandate from the League of Nations was to administer all of Palestine on both sides of the Jordan River until a Jewish homeland could be established there. But in 1922, Britain's foreign secretary at the time, Winston Churchill, summarily lopped off three quarters of the land comprising the Palestinian mandate and gave it to the Hashemite monarchy in return for oil rights. While much of the Jewish world was up in arms when Churchill gave away a majority of the land of Palestine, Zionist leadership at the time argued that the remaining portion of Palestine west of the Jordan River was enough and was better than nothing for a Jewish people dreaming to return and to rebuild their historical homeland. Then during the War of Independence of 1948, the West Bank was captured by the Kingdom of Jordan, which from the end of the war until 1967 occupied the West Bank. The entire international community rejected Jordan's sovereignty over the West Bank, except for Great Britain and Pakistan. Those were the only two countries which recognized Jordan's annexation of the West Bank. As far as the United Nations and the world community was concerned, Jordan was occupying the West Bank from 1949 until 1967. And that's why Eugene Rostow, a former dean of Yale Law School, who was also Under Secretary of State for President Lyndon Johnson, wrote after the Six-Day War that Israel has an unassailable legal right to establish settlements in the West Bank. In essence, from the end of World War I and the fall 
of the Turkish Ottoman Empire until today, there's never been any legal sovereignty by any nation over the West Bank. Now, for those who believe a two-state solution will one day resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, most of the West Bank, more than 90% of the West Bank, will one day become part of a Palestinian state. And because the West Bank is viewed by American administrations and by most of the world community as the Palestinian state in waiting, American administrations have been either passively or actively opposed to Israel's building of settlements on the West Bank. America has viewed settlement activity as a signal to the Palestinian community that Israel never intends to permit Palestinian sovereignty or a Palestinian state to exist on the West Bank. It's a matter of symbolism. But it was not until the Carter administration that the State Department expressed the view that the settlements violated international law. And the Carter position was reversed by all successive presidents. And thus, President Ronald Reagan declared in 1981 that the settlements were not illegal. Reagan criticized them as ill-advised, but not as illegal. Now, where does the issue of legality come from? What's the basis of the legal issue? Part of the Fourth Geneva Convention states that an occupying power shall not transfer part of its own civilian population into the territory it occupies. Is Israel guilty of transferring part of its own population onto the West Bank? America argues no. America maintains that the Geneva Convention refers to forcible deportations, such as those practiced by the Nazis when they forcibly deported their own German Jews to concentration camps. The Geneva Convention was meant to protect civilians in times of war and clearly prohibits mass forcible transfers of protected persons from occupied territories. Obviously, this definition of illegal transfer does not apply to Israelis voluntarily moving on to the West Bank. From this perspective, there's nothing illegal about Israeli settlements. And what about the Oslo Accords, agreed to by Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat? What do the Oslo Accords require of Israel? Does Israeli settlement activity violate the Oslo Accords? The answer is, Israeli settlements do not violate the Oslo Accords or any of their secondary agreements. And while Arafat had hoped to address Israeli settlements in his negotiations with Rabin, Arafat agreed to the Oslo Accords without any reference to a settlement freeze. What the Oslo Accords did say about Israeli settlements was that they would be addressed in later negotiations. And from Dory Gold's perspective, if the Obama administration is now seeking to constrain Israeli settlement activity, the administration is essentially trying to obtain additional Israeli concessions that were not formally required according to Israel's legal obligations under the Oslo Accords. In other words, President Obama is taking a bargaining chip away from Israel in any future negotiations by insisting that Israel now unilaterally and without any gesture in return give up settlement activity which in no way is intrinsically illegal by international law or by any agreement entered into by Israel with the Palestinians. And if American administrations, since Ronald Reagan, have not viewed Israeli settlements as illegal, when did settlements become such a volatile issue? The answer is, with the report of the Mitchell Commission 
after the outbreak of the Second Intifada in the year 2000. Senator George Mitchell recommended in May of 2001 that as part of what he called confidence-building measures, Israel should freeze all settlement activity, including the natural growth of existing settlements. It was the current Obama envoy to the Middle East, George Mitchell, who spoke of a settlement freeze, including natural growth. The Bush administration adopted the Mitchell Report, putting the settlement issue right in the center of U.S.-Israeli discussions. To address this American concern, the government of Ariel Sharon proposed that Israel would build within existing settlement borders. In other words, settlements would only build from their outer ring inward. That way, Israel could address the need for natural growth without taking up more land for Israelis living in the settlements. But when the Bush administration did draft its 2003 Roadmap for Peace, it incorporated the Mitchell Report's settlement freeze, including a freeze on natural growth. To enable Israel to accept this roadmap, the Sharon government reached an understanding with the United States about exactly what a settlement freeze entailed. America and Israel agreed that no new settlements would be built, no Palestinian land would be expropriated or otherwise seized for the purpose of settlements. Construction within the settlements would be confined to the existing line of construction and public funds would not be earmarked for encouraging settlements. Sharon also agreed to remove what were known as unauthorized outposts, small settlement extensions that were built without formal Israeli government approval. However, the problem is the Bush administration and the Sharon government never put these understandings in writing which has allowed the Obama administration to question their existence and validity. Now, even though there's no written document, Israel nonetheless feels that it's made a commitment to freeze settlement growth so that it has largely adhered to these guidelines for more than five years. And Israel feels strongly that settlement activity is not diminishing the territory of a future Palestinian entity. Finally, one more question on Israeli West Bank settlements. What percentage of territory do Israeli settlements comprise on the West Bank? The answer is 1.7 percent. So that any natural growth would be a marginal increase with virtually no impact. The issue of natural growth, therefore, is purely symbolic. Moreover, Ambassador Gold argues that since Israel unilaterally withdrew 9,000 Israeli settlers from the Gaza Strip in 2005, the argument that a settler presence will undermine a future territorial compromise has lost much of its previous force. For the sake of peace and in the natural process of peace negotiations as called for by the Oslo Accords, Israel and the Palestinians will arrive at a solution of the settlement issue and Israel will dismantle those settlements in accordance with any peace agreement and will withdraw the settlers now living there. But until Israel and the Palestinians have a negotiated peace settlement, it would seem strategically premature for Israel to give up a crucial bargaining chip by freezing all settlement activity, including natural growth. For Dory Gold, Israeli settlement activity is an overstated issue in the peace process. Legally, and diplomatically, 
settlements do not present a problem that could possibly justify putting at risk the U.S.-Israel relationship. We hope this overview of the history of the West Bank and Israeli settlement activity and a review of the way in which the United States has viewed the legal status of settlements has been helpful. I recognize it's not an easy subject to grasp in one sitting. It's nice that you can watch our program again if you wish. But most of all, it's important not to let media or political rhetoric blur the truth on any matter of such significance, especially when public opinion can help sway public policy. As always, I invite you to respond to this program. Please email me or write me this week. I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who can send a tax-deductible contribution of $18 or more to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media to help support our programming. Tax-deductible checks may be made out to GEM and mailed to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. Please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD, and we thank you for your kind support.